Hello there, it's Lisa Starr with another episode of the StarCast podcast where we talk all things wellness. You know, there's been such a surge in interest in wellness businesses. I can tell you that as a consultant working in the industry, I don't think I've ever been so busy since COVID and many of my colleagues say the same. Lots of people want to get into wellness businesses or open wellness businesses. But that also opens the door for another sort of activity that's business related, which is selling your wellness business. Some people are choosing this time to exit, and they may or may not have had an exit strategy. And it's something that we don't talk about that often. Like, you know, we're all about opening and marketing and doing better, but you don't really think about the long term picture. And I was recently in Nashville for the Data Driven Salon Summit, and I saw our speaker today, our guest today on stage, and I thought she made a really compelling case for how to plan to sell your business. So I'd like to welcome April McDaniel to the podcast today. Thanks, Lisa. It's so Um, exciting to be here today. Oh, it's great to have you. It took a while. April's a busy lady, uh, accountants are, and so she's a CPA and she works for Copsa Ate, which is been referred to as the only CPA firm that specializes in salons and spas. I can vouch for that because I met one of the principals many years ago, and even then it was very unusual to specialize in our field. But she's very experienced in financial analysis, taxation, HR benefits, leases, and all the ways that you need to understand the financial implications of the decisions that you make to your business. And April is a really popular speaker, and I thought she did a great job of de, sort of demystifying and simplifying what can be a challenging topic on selling your spa salon or beauty business. So April, how did you come to specialize in this field? Well, um, my journey to COPSA OD uh, is probably a little bit different than some of our other uh, CPAs and accountants that work here at COPSA OD, but Uh, I started off actually as a CPA working in the auditing function at a big five accounting firm. Uh, It was a big five at the time. And then uh, fell in love and moved uh, moved a couple times to chase chase that, my sweetheart, I guess. And I met uh, Larry Kopsa, who I'm sure is the person, Lisa, Mm -hmm, that you met and that you had met. Larry and his wife, Maggie, um, attend the same Catholic parish that I go to. And we met um, probably mostly because of, well, I'll share a personal story. Our oldest child, when he was born, uh, was born healthy, but became very ill. Oh. And um, when things like that happen, you know, you surround yourself with people that can join you in prayer and help you through that mm-hmm. situation. And Larry and his wife, Maggie, did that for us. Mm-hmm. And um, at that time, I had left public accounting. I was working at a bank locally here in York, Nebraska, and decided that just really wasn't working for me. So I came to work for Copes Odie. And um, just for a short time, though, and I left and came back uh, uh, 10 years later. Oh, um, funny. Yeah. So I that's where a lot of my experience came from, though. So for 10 years, I was the director for administration at an airport, and that met, meant that I handled all things accounting, all things finance, all things HR, uh, property management, leasing, all those kinds of things. And so I got a lot of um, good knowledge there. And every year I still talk to Larry Mm -hmm. and he'd say, when are you coming back? When are you coming back? And uh, after our uh, son passed away, um, it's okay. Thank you. It just made even more sense for me to make a different move in my career. And I came back to Copsa Odie uh, with the plan of um, h- helping to lead the team here, the salon and spa team, um, kind of into the future. Larry was retiring, and we have a great team here at Copsa Odie. There's 25 to 30 of us. Um, but you know what? Not all accountants like to do what you and I are doing today mm. in front of people and speak <laughs> and educate. And I had that trait, and I love, I love that part of what I do. Um, and so, you know, the salon and spa. A niche education really came from my time here at Copsa Odi. Um, but I'm like many women, I absolutely love to go get my hair done and my nails done and, um, you know, have a massage and, and be in the spa. And so it's, it's just a ton of fun for me to be involved in this business. 
Well, that's great. You get to do something that you love and that you're good at in a field that you also love. So yeah, yeah, all, all good things. Very enjoyable. So I like what you said about coming back to COPSA OT with a plan, because it relates to really the topic of our conversation today, which is having a plan when you're a business owner. And for the business owners listening, as I referenced in the intro, you know, we're not always thinking about, well, what happens when I am successful, right? We're always worried about chasing that success. And when we get there, then what happens? Um, So I know, April, that you are really good at advising people about planning ahead. And I thought we could start with, you know, when when you're starting the business, what should you be thinking about long term? Is that the time to think about your exit strategy right at the beginning? Well, I think that it is. But the reality is that for most salon, spa um, owners, they're a technician, right? It's a technician that's Mm -hmm. left typically that's left um, another organization where they've been an employee possibly, and they decide that they wanna go out on their own. And so there's all these challenges of starting a new business Um, and and thinking about the end when you're doing the beginning things is a struggle because there's just so much to be thinking about when you're starting a business. But I am a, a believer that if you do that, that it's much easier to sell when it's that time. Um, it's kind of like any other thing in your life. If you keep the end in mind, you, you do the best that you can all of the time, right? Mm -hmm. We all know that life is sometimes too short. And so if we are always doing our best and putting our best foot forward, then, then we're successful in what we want, writing down our goals, you know, having someone hold us accountable and things like that. So, you know, when somebody is starting their business, if they're thinking about a transition plan at some point, that's going to allow them to set their business up for success the whole time. Um, some of the pitfalls that we see if someone hasn't done that um, are things like maybe there's not processes and procedures in place. Maybe they've set up a compensation plan with their team that is not viable in a business. If somebody else buys it. Um, and they just haven't really thought about things like maybe even a, um, a shareholder loan that they've taken from the business. And and what that looks like and the impact that's going to have on their selling price. So um, those are certainly some things that they need to be thinking about from the beginning. Um, The shareholder loan thing is something I'll just talk to on briefly and then I'll let you ask me your next question. But um, a lot of times when a tax preparer is looking at your uh, QuickBooks or whatever accounting software you're using, if they don't know what an expense is for, they just place it in an account that is like an owner's draw, or maybe it's a shareholder receivable. And your responsibility as an owner really is to look at what's in that account, because the goal really is to take any of those items and end up getting a deduction, right? So this is the line item that says, ask owner, right? At the end where we don't know what to, how to categorize it. Yeah. Or, you know, it's also the area, it's also where it says draws or distributions on your balance sheet. Um, it's also the section that says shareholder receivable. You know, we've come to help people sometimes that don't even know why that exists. And that's uh, funny. So Uh, it's important. It's important to know what that is. Well, it's important to know where your money goes, right? And how you make money and how you don't make money. How many owners that you work with, well, maybe the ones you work with are probably really good at this, but do you encounter owners who are not that conversant with their financial results? Yeah, I would say so. That's usually what leads them to us, Lisa. Um, Honestly, is that they want to understand the why, um, that they don't know what questions to ask. And I think that's the hardest part about being a business owner, particularly if you've come to the business um, by way of being maybe a technician in the past. You know, I would never try to give a massage. I wouldn't be good at it. I would never try to color somebody else's hair. I'd be terrible at it. But for some reason, business owners sometimes think they can be the everything in their business. Mm -hmm. So when salons and spas come to us as new clients, you know, a lot of our uh, processes with them is really just about educating them about what they're, what's on their financials and things that they can deduct and ways to be thinking into the future so that when that time comes that they want to retire or maybe step away from being behind the massage table or behind the chair doing hair, 
that they can do that. So to give them the financial freedom to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So if you're an owner that's a technician and you start your own salon or spa business, do you advise them for a certain amount of time to work behind the chair before removing themselves more into management? I mean, what guidance do you give on that? Honestly, our ideal client is one that's not behind the, very, the chair very much already. Okay. Um, now we do have some, of course, that because of the COVID pandemic and because of the great resignation, they had to go back to being behind the chair or they had to go back to the table, you know, and start working or doing esthetician services, things like that. So that's happened, certainly. It's always great to have that trade to fall back on, right? Mm -hmm. But the reality is that there's a reason why really successful businesses have a CFO mm -hmm. and they have somebody that does that for them. The reason is because it allows you to do what you're really great at and that professional to do what they're good at and then you can jive together. So, um, you know, having a a um, having the ability to be kind of like a financial language and or excuse me a language interpreter mm -hmm. for uh, for the trade is really really important um, so one of the things I would ask owners to do is think about the relationship that they have with their CPA whether it's your tax person or your accountant do they understand your business mm -hmm. because when it comes time to sell your business um, it's going to be really important that they know the ins and outs of the industry um, it's going to be important that they understand gift cards and, you know, series and those types of things because they do impact your sale price. Um, and so it's good to know what that means at the end of the day. Well, just setting up the chart of accounts is something, oh, you sure. know, I mean, I tell my clients, first of all, to second your thought that they should not be working in a treatment capacity. Now, in an emergency, okay, one thing, you know, see a client now and then, but you know, you can't run your business from inside of a treatment room, at least not effectively. And um, to your second point, my consulting clients will, will say, okay, you know, I've got this accountant and I always ask to speak with the accountant and I'm not an accountant, but I've been looking at these numbers for a very long time. And I know how the chart of accounts should be set up. And if they don't understand sort of the cost of goods, you know, where the labor goes, how we split that up and they don't, we don't always get reports that make sense. And oh. to me, that's the basis, right? If you're getting financial reports that don't help you, what's the point? I would, can I cheers to that? Because, yeah. <laughs> um, some of the reports that we see uh, when clients first come to us, I just can't, I just can't even believe it. You know, when you get a profit and loss and there's accounts on there for every vendor they pay, yes. and, you know, um, instead of, you know, expenses being in areas like advertising and mm -hmm. rent and professional services and uh, front desk staff and things like that. And, and to your point, if you don't know what your variable costs are. You're not going to know what your gross profit percentage is. You're not going to know what it's going to take to pay for something. If someone comes along and offers you this really great special on a new um, shampoo bowl or whatever it is, you don't know what it's going to take in sales to pay for something like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we try to talk in, in that way so that when someone is um, trying to make decisions, they can make educated decisions. And the only way that you can do that is if you have good financial information to start from. Um, and it does, uh, it does lead to issues when you go to sell if your financials are not in order. We are sometimes hired to do that due diligence process for mm. potential buyers. Certainly, we have clients that want to expand their businesses and have additional locations. And so we get involved in that due diligence process, you know, requesting tax returns, requesting copies of HR manuals, copies of leases, mm -hmm. um, tax returns and all those things. And, you know, one of the biggest red flags is if a tax return doesn't agree to the QuickBooks, mm -hmm. why, why would that be, you know? And so trying to figure out those things. Um, so having those things in order, understanding those numbers is really important. No, for sure. And we do we do have to be sensitive to the fact that people, 
that own salons and spas and wellness businesses are often, as you said, technicians who are really passionate about what they do and they feel they can do it better, but they may not have a business or financial background that they bring into it. And, and I often find that the case. Um, in your work, how long do you think it takes you to sort of train someone, if for lack of a better word, on you know what all these numbers mean? It depends on how often I get to meet with them. If I'm meeting with a client once a month, I feel like they can have a pretty good understanding of numbers in 18 months. Um, if we're meeting once a quarter or you know twice a year, it's going to take much longer. Mm -hmm. But it depends on your commitment too. It depends on when I have you with me, do I really have you with me or is your mind somewhere else? Mm. You no, know, I was recently talking to a salon owner who is, um, she's a rock star technician and she's a rock star at a bus as a business person too, but she's having a really hard time making time for the business side of things. Yeah. And she said, I just think I'm going to cancel those meetings um, uh, with a coach because I just don't have time. And I said, do you not? I mean, is it that you don't really have time or is it you're choosing this other thing? And mm -hmm. I think what we choose to do is what is, you know, what point, what's going to sure. happen. And so, you know, I challenged her instead of uh, letting those appointments get scheduled on her book to try to block herself out, to give her that time. Um, because if she's really great about the time that she's with me, giving me her time, but she has some other things that she's working through in the business and she needs this financial coach to do that. And she's struggling with finding the time to meet with them. So I guess I'm honored she's choosing to meet with me, but I think she'd also do very well having their expertise um, as well. So I think you just, you have to schedule it. It's kind of like a doctor's appointment. Mm. Schedule it, <laughs> make it happen. Otherwise it's not ever going to happen. Well, it's a daunting proposal when you're not a numbers person and you don't want to be a numbers person, but the root of what we do, success, is that you can be profitable. And, you know, when I came up in the spa world, it was like profit was like a bad word. Like you weren't supposed to be profitable. You were supposed to just be altruistic and have a business just because you like to take care of people. And that's a very nice idea. But if you're not profitable, you can't keep the doors open. You can't employ people. You can't grow and reach more people. And if you don't know how you make money, then you don't know what you're doing. You have no map, basically. And Lisa, think about all the other service industries. Nobody else live, works that way. You know, if you're in the auto industry and you're fixing cars and you're servicing cars, you're charging what you need to do, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a doctor or you're a nurse, or, you know, in a, in a practice, you're charging what you need to charge to make money. There's never been anything wrong with that, you know? And so... I think, you know, there's another key point to think about is to take this industry really has to work hard to take themselves seriously. They're, they are a multi-billion dollar industry that sometimes forgets that they are a key part of, um, you know, what goes on around us. And um, they have every right to be successful business people. And it is a, there is a business model that allows them to be profitable and they should be able to be profitable. You know, they pour their sweat and their tears into the businesses for so many years that, you know, when they go to sell, they shouldn't have to be disappointed with what that looks like. Right. And having that plan is helpful. You know, being profitable doesn't mean that you drive a Bentley, right? It just means that you can keep the business going every year as a going concern to help your clients and your employees. So, you know, back to the numbers issue, let's say you have a a youngish owner you've been working with for two years and they, they, you know, they've got the business up on its feet, COVID notwithstanding, you know, what, what sorts of things do you start to advise them on in terms of the exit strategy and how far out to plan? Well, we use a questionnaire that we call a pre-exit checklist. And for us, it's not just about the business. It's about them personally. Most of our clients we work with personally as well on the tax side and, mm -hmm. Of course, if you're selling a business, it's going to impact you um, both on the business and the tax side, business and personal side for taxes. So um, we go through this pre-exit checklist, which touches on things like, you know, do you have a plan in place where your management team knows what to do if you don't show up to work tomorrow? Mm. You know, 
Do you, um, do you have somebody else on those bank accounts so that if something happens to you, payroll can still process? Um, really good and, questions. You know, do you have a, um, do you have any estate planning done so that your family's taken care of? So there's no question about who's going to run the business when you're gone or, or not able to take care of things. Um, it, it's happened a few times here at Copsa Odi where we've lost, um, we've lost the person that's the primary contact um, to a sudden health event. And so, you know, having those things in place so people know what to do, you know, ask yourself as a business owner, if I were to die in a car accident tomorrow, would my people show up to work mm. and take care of the clients? Would they know what to do? And I think it's just like when we think about death in our personal lives, we don't want to think about it. But the reality is that it can happen. It does happen. It happens. And so, you know, we really start to talk to people about those things that you don't really want to talk about. It's also really important that you have, um, that you've thought about what you need. You know, what do you need to feel comfortable at retirement? For some owners, they have someone internally that they've been grooming or that they have in mind. Mm. And there's maybe nothing that they want financially. Maybe they don't have any heirs. And so they they want to just be able to uh, pass that on to maybe their manager or something. And so thinking about that, thinking about how you're going to identify that buyer, if that's an issue. Um, we also talk about whether or not an outside valuation would be needed or if a um, industry standard like a factor to, factor of EBITDA can be used, and that stands for earnings before interest tax, depreciation, and amortization. I'm sure, Lisa, you've heard that before. Yes. Um, so, you know, we talk about that. We talk about, well, what does it look like if you would do an asset sale versus a stock sale? And, um, you know, just really making sure that they understand the process. But mm -hmm. for us, it's best if that starts five to 10 years out. Um, from when they really want to move on. It's never fun when someone calls you and they say, well, I sold this salon, <sighs> you know? And it happens every once in a while, you know? I, I used to be, I used to help audit banks and I remember someone saying, I bought a bank today and they bought it on the golf course, you know? And I think a lot of that happens probably in the banking industry. That's I don't, funny. It, it did in this bank situation anyway. And I think, well, I hope your tax accountant you know, can help you because there's things like, um, you know, sometimes you'll hear about installment sales. Well, installment sales can create taxability tax issues for the seller, even if they don't get all the money up front. Mm. So, you know, thinking about what that matters, there's something called depreciation recapture. You know, if, if you've depreciated all these assets and all of a sudden you get paid for them, well, you're going to have to recapture some of that. So it becomes taxable. Mm. And so, you know, understanding that, understanding your basis in the, in the business, you know, something, understanding whether you're going to have capital gains tax or ordinary income tax, um, all of these things that you should be talking to your accountant about so that when that happens, you're prepared for it. So this questionnaire that you give people, I guess it touches on these things, and it's probably a very good way to help them give pause and think, oh boy, there's a lot here that I haven't really thought of. Yeah, for sure. It, it can be scary. It can be overwhelming for people. Um, that's why it's good that you do it early. Right. <laughs> because Sooner it gives better. them an opportunity to think about it, you know, Um so yeah, for sure. Does it make sense, April, like in different situations, do you talk to them about their their court, their status? Like if they're an LLC or a sole proprietor, or a, a sub S, like what kind of corporation they're set up to be? It does matter um, when it comes to the sale proceeds. It certainly matters. So we talk through that. It matters more when you're doing tax planning in the life of the client's business. So um, you know, there's certainly good reasons to have a partnership. There's good reasons to have an S corporation. Uh, we're very, um, very pro LLC uh, people. We like that. It gives you a little bit extra liability coverage. Um, it allows for easy transition to an S corporation, if that makes sense, from a sole proprietorship situation. Um, we're not very fond of C corporations, to be mm -hmm. honest, in our salon and spa world. That double taxation doesn't make a lot of sense for us. 
Um, but yeah, I would say it factors in when you're doing the tax calculation, but for us, it makes even more difference when we're doing tax planning over the life of the business. Mm -hmm. So let's say we have an owner that's an LLC and they say to you, okay, I, I want to be out in five years. And, uh, and what, what sorts of things do you say to them? Okay, here's what we need to work on first, second, third. Sure. Well, I think first it's about making sure that if they have any expenses that are running through the business that they feel are discretionary, that we start separating those um, so that we know what they are. And, That's like and have, having the business pay for your car and that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. So usually those are pretty easy to come by if they're our client because we're keeping them separate anyway. But um, typically in a sales situation, you're looking at three or four years of financials. So if it happens to happen within that time period, we may have to go back and look at things. Um, and so it's good to be able to identify those. Now, it, it's possible that the new owner may want to do the same thing, but it's something mm. that's discretionary in that. And so they get to decide. So we're looking for things like that. Um, I would also say making sure that if if they happen to have any skeletons in the closet, you know, old HR issues, um, if they have any tax issues, notices and things like that to start getting that cleaned up, we're probably doing that anyway. If they're our client, most of our clients don't have those issues. We don't take new clients that have issues like that typically. Mm -hmm. um, but we also look for things that um, can make sure that it really is showing that the business is a good investment. So, you know, if the, if the owner happens to personally own the building that the uh, salon or spa is paying reasonable rent to them so that we know the financials can support it. Mm. Uh, when you go to sell a building, if you own the building, or excuse me, if you go to sell a salon or a spa and you own the building separately from the um, salon business or spa business, which is what we would suggest that you do, then um, we have to think about whether or not you're paying reasonable rent. And we try to set that up anyway, but you know, sometimes the, the goal is to at least cover expenses, mm -hmm. right? Especially if there's a mortgage on it. So, you know, but if you're looking at it as a way to maybe help you in retirement, you want to make a little bit more money on it than that. And so we're looking at things like that. What are discretionary items? What are things that need cleaned up? Um, making sure that, um, if the owner is a technician, that they have a plan in place to have their uh, production covered, you know, start working with them on getting off the books. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if if I'm 75% of the sales and I'm the owner and I'm going to sell, my business isn't worth as much. No, for sure. And so how do I get rid of that? And if I'm a sole proprietor, there's usually, there's not a W-2 wage in the business. And so if, if, you're thinking of an outside buyer coming in and buying that business, the value just went down a lot unless mm -hmm. you can show them that the business can run without your sales. So all important things to think about. And, and let's talk about for a moment, the, the gift card liability. Oh, yes. I mean, I get asked this quite a lot about gift cards and, you know, I've had clients that really want to sell a ton of them at Christmas. And I'm always like, well, Let's sell them, but let's not make a big deal about it. You know, unless you're going to keep this money in escrow and have it to show a potential buyer, mm -hmm. this has probably derailed more than one sale in your experience. Yes. Yeah, for sure. It, it's a huge reduction to a sale value too when there's a big outstanding gift card liability. There's no doubt about that. Um, and it's very complicated because, um, what the IRS expects is that you're recognizing some of that income, whether or not you've done the service or not. Uh, and we have we've done a lot of research on this. And our position here at COPSA OD is that um, once the gift card's been outstanding for three years, we start recognizing it. Mm -hmm. So you're going to pay tax on it is what that means. And then when you go to sell, if you've already paid tax on it, the comp, the tax calculation gets even more complicated. Mm. Um, but if you haven't paid tax on it, you go to sell, you have an even more, a larger liability, you know? So um, it's really important to not just think of gift cards as a way to get extra cash at Christmas. Right. Um, you know, 
and encourage your clients to use them if they're buying them because they really can be a headache in a sale. For sure. I mean, how often do you see owners actually keep most of the funds in escrow as they're supposed to be kept? Never. Never, right? I mean, I've often said, well, you know, 10 or 20% of that, okay. But but you've got to put the rest somewhere. You can't have like no line item on your balance sheet for that liability that matches the asset. Yeah, I mean, the liability is always booked in our situation, but the cash isn't typically there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what happened. You know, it really started as this, Christmas boon. I worked in a business like that. We we would do $2 million in the month of December in oh, gift yes. cards. Yeah. And um, you know, it's like it's like so exciting when that money's coming in, but then you have to think about, well, okay, now what? You know, now how do we plan for this? And it isn't go on a trip to Europe and buy all new computers, right? No. So not. <laughs> April, you also mentioned the sort of the structure, and I want to touch on that when you're buying a business, you know, asking, you know, financials are one thing, of course, you want to buy a business that either is or can be profitable, but the structure, the infrastructure part is really important. Having HR policies, having an employee handbook, an operations manual, job description, sort of structure. Could you speak a bit to how that feeds into the value of the business? All of that's important because I tell you what, if I'm going to come invest my money in your business, I want to know that the people are going to stick around and that you have good procedures in place so that I can come in and it's a turnkey operation. Um, the It is scary for a buyer to buy um, a salon or spa and feel like they have no uh, no structure at all. Um, to me, it's a discount in the purchase price. If that happens, um, I can't tell you what that is, if it's 5%, whatever, but I would say that certainly as an educated buyer, uh, which I think I would be one, if I was going to buy a salon or I think you would be, you know, um, those are things that I'd be looking for because we all know, and we've all experienced a walkout. Mm Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there's no way in most states, there's no way to require somebody to stay at work after you have a change in ownership. Mm -hmm. Um, But the best way for that to happen is to know that the prior owner has good policies and procedures in place, that the team is truly a team, that the clients of the business are, are really clients of the business. They're not clients of, you know, Jack and Jill. Right. A particular technician. Yes. Um, And so I think sometimes, you know, when, when someone decides that they're going to buy a business, it's because some friend at the bar offered it to them or offered it to them at church or, you know, they, they met them at the mall or I met them at a show, you know, I met these guys at the show Mm -hmm. and they seem really awesome. So I'm going to buy their salon and they don't go through the process because it sounds like a lot of fun to do that. Well, you meet the people and you, you like the idea of it, but to your point, that's not what makes a business, right? It's it's the ability to replicate financial results on a regular basis consistently mm-hmm. that to me makes it a viable business. And that means everyone knows their job, they do their job, they understand the implications of not doing their job, they're good to the clients, the business has a good reputation. And those things just don't happen by happenstance generally. They, they happen with structure and guidance, correct? Right. Yeah, and having having the systems, um, you know, software systems to support that is also important. Um, not just the, you know, the manual, but you know, making sure you're using a good software to be able to track activity and and your key performance indicators and things like that. Um, if your team knows what their goals are and they're looking at them and they're watching them, which takes software to do it, Mm -hmm. then I know if I come in looking at your business that you've done a good job training your team, Mm -hmm. right? But if you're using a a board in the back room and you have your goals written down on it and it's dated in April and here we are in July, I know you've taken the finger off the pulse many months ago and your people are just running around blind. Mm -hmm. So 
um, you know, it's it's things maybe that most people don't think about, but they make sense to think about. Um, well, they're not fun or sexy to think about employee no. manuals. No, employee manuals, quite frankly, suck. Mm-hmm. They do. Yeah, they're, it's a lot of work. You have to have an attorney to do it really mm-hmm. right. You need an attorney. You know, I don't know how many that I've seen that somebody Googled and they found one and they downloaded it and they didn't even take the time to take out the ABC company. Right. Or it has nothing to do with our business. You know, I, I create manuals for my clients, which then go to an attorney in that state, but we have to have policies around what if my mother wants a service on a Saturday, right? Right. And, and what are my employee discounts? And what if I want to take off the month of December and the things that maybe aren't as impactful in other businesses, but really are in ours. Right. Right. You're exactly right. I, I would agree completely that that stuff is just as important as the financial statements. Right. And, yeah. and so, you know, yeah, you can't just Google employee handbook and have something that's really applicable. The but, other really important thing I think to look at in a sale per, or a purchase is to look at a lease. You know, mm-hmm. how long do they have left on that lease? Is mm-hmm. that lease assignable to somebody else? Um, you know, are, is there a gross receipts clause in the lease? I absolutely can't stand those. You know, why as a business owner should I have to share part of my gross receipts with my landlord? It doesn't make any sense to me, but we see them more and more. I don't know, Lisa, if you see those too. I do. And it's common uh, in strip centers and sort of those kind of situations to see that. Mm-hmm. And I don't care for them. Um, I, I just, I would love to see them taken out. So, you know, having your person, your CPA or your account, somebody, your attorney, look at those leases to catch things like that. You know, I, we all, we request leases from our clients and it's not from the legal aspect. It's from the accounting aspect. What mm-hmm. kind of liability do you have? Um, but as a <laughs> part of the due diligence process, if you're selling or buying, it's important to know whether or not there's an assignment of the lease clause, you know, and what happens. Is there a renewal clause? Um, you know, some assignment clauses will allow me to assign the lease to you, Lisa, but I'm still on the hook if you default. Mm. You know, and you may not want that as an owner who's trying to exit. Right. So those are important things too. So trying to time transition around a renewal of a lease, if you have some of those kind of tricky clauses in there is also important. All right. Good to know. So when you think about, you know, what to do, how to plan better, you had mentioned earlier about the depreciation. Let's touch on that. So you own your business, you've invested, you know, 50, 60, 80, 100,000 in equipment treatment tables, shampoo bowls, et cetera, you've taken that depreciation, which is generally a three to five year depreciation schedule on most of that? It depends Mm because you might have taken fast depreciation or bonus and depreciated all of it. So within a few years, you have probably received that benefit. Mm -hmm. And then you go to sell the business and you mentioned that you'll have to reintroduce that topic. How does that work? the, the tax co- calculation on a sale um, is fairly complicated because if it's an asset sale, which most are, what you have to do is you have to allocate value to the, the physical assets. So all of that equipment you just mentioned, you're also doing an allocation to um, the goodwill in the company. Mm-hmm. So it depends on that allocation, whether or not you would have a gain on the equipment or you would have a loss on the equipment. And then the other side of that is that depreciation recapture. So at the end of the day, it all kind of flows into other things as well. I'm trying to keep this pretty simple. Sure. But, you know, if over the lifetime of the business, you have positive basis, meaning that you haven't taken out all of the earnings, um, you still have a positive basis in the, in the business, that um, recapture can go against that basis, okay, in the overall calculation of tax, but it's not as simple as um, me telling you what the tax ramification is of that recapture, because it all kind of goes into this big calculation. Mm -hmm. That's why it's important that you have your tax person involved. 
you know, um, on at Data Driven, I met a salon owner, a fairly new salon owner, that um, they they purchased the salon, but they hadn't um, they hadn't worked with the seller to figure out what the allocation was of the sale proceeds. Mm. Well, if I'm a seller, I want the allocation of the proceeds um, to to be different than I do if I'm a buyer. So as a buyer. I want the allocation to be high in the asset category because then I can depreciate a bunch of stuff. Right. Right. I don't want the allocation to be high for goodwill because I have to take that over a much longer period of time. Mm. Okay. But if I'm a if I'm the seller, goodwill is at a small is at a capital gains rate. Okay. So it's a less rate than ordinary income tax. So, you know, this particular owner, they hadn't had that conversation with the seller. When they did it, they didn't know that. And so here they are with a bunch of goodwill that they can't depreciate. Mm. Ever or just not in the same time frame? It is a, a short, it's a longer time frame. Mm-hmm. So um, where a lot of equipment's maybe five, seven years, this is more like 15. Wow. So you'll have an agreement on the price and then how much is to actual physical asset and how much is to goodwill? Right. Okay. Right. Good to know. The other thing that you have to think about as a seller is what about debt? Hmm. You know, you asked me the question about things that I'm doing ahead of time before the sale, Mm -hmm. years ahead of time. You know, you've got to get out of debt because at the end of the day, you still owe the debt. So on a stock sale, you know, that buyer is not going to want it. And so you're going to have to either discount the uh, value or get it out of the company. Mm -hmm. Um, and on an asset sale, it just simply doesn't go along with it. And so, you know, if you're someone that got an EIDL loan during the economic crisis and you're getting ready to sell, you owe that back. Mm. So trying to get rid of debt is also really, really important. What if you own the building? You know, what are, the, I'm sure there are positive implications for owning the building as well as the business, but, but do you see people sell the business and retain the bill, the building, the real estate? I've seen both actually. Um, we, we helped with a sale in Michigan um, here a couple of years ago. And in that instance, um, the, the new salon owner is renting from the old salon owner because the old salon owner owned the owned the building. Mm-hmm. Now we want the building outside of the salon. We don't want it inside the salon entity. We want it outside. Um, the appreciation of, of um, land and buildings is high typically. Mm. And so we'd rather have that, that gain happen outside of the salon if it can. And so uh, that's really, really important. Um, we also had a Florida transaction this past, that was more recent, actually this past year, and they sold both. They sold both the building, which they owned with a family member, and they sold the salon, which they owned personally. Mm. So, um, you know, those are things that, you know, the, the gain on, on selling a building or land is treated differently too. So, you know, having that conversation with your tax person so that you understand the tax liability is important. So if at the end of the day, I want a million dollars for my business, what does that mean? I need to make the the selling price look Mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. And if you never sit down with your tax person and have that conversation, you're going to be very surprised at the end of the day. Probably in a negative way. (laughs) Yes. Typically it's negative. So, you know, we say, you know, usually your tax person's the best person to lead the team, but they're not the only person on the team. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're going through that process, you definitely need an attorney. You may need a valuation company. You might need a broker and you may need a coach um, mm-hmm. that's specific to your industry too. Uh, so especially if you don't have those manuals and things figured out, there's a lot of really great coaches out there. Lisa, I know you know that, you know, that can help people like you do. Um, put together that information. So I think it's a team. I think your CPA is probably your person that leads the team because they know um, you're finding all about your Mm. financials. Um, But you need all those people to do it right. 
April, let's talk uh, in closing a little bit about valuation, the big question on everybody's lips. I mean, that's what I'm asked probably more than anything. And we haven't had what I'd call an industry standard formula for either the spa or the salon side. What are you seeing? Mostly we see earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization with ad backs for um, things that don't happen very often. So think about what people's balance sheets and income statements looked like because of ERC credits and because Mm -hmm. of PPP loans and things like that. So those are things that end up getting kind of taken out, I guess. Um, And then the factor that we've seen most recently is in between a three and four factor, which is a great factor. But then there's adjustments to that for liabilities like gift cards and, um, you know, other debt that could possibly be out there. So um, that's mostly what we see now. Uh, we, we do also see some comparables. Um, there is a company, I can't think of the name of the company right now, that does do some work in this space when it comes to uh, licensed valuations. And um, we like our salons to give those to us if they are looking at selling or if they're looking at buying, we want to look at it. Because if it's not someone that understands the industry, they typically don't get the adjustments right. Mm -hmm. And so that part can be kind of scary if it's not done correctly. Um, So licensed valuation firms can um, be of great help, but they also can be of detriment if they don't understand the business. So I'd say EBITDA and then the licensed valuation firm, which often uses comparables if they have them. And then, you know, there's using just straight from a tax form and arriving at discretionary cash and then figuring out the return on the investment that the investor needs or that you think is reasonable, whether it's seven to 10 percent every year, and then working through what that number looks like for the selling price. So you're saying three to four times EBITDA for a Mm -hmm. sale price. So if a a business is clearing 25,000 a year after all said and done, then the sale price would be 75 to 100,000. It depends also on the assets that could be getting sold, like inventory, Mm -hmm. you know, um, there's adjustments for things like that as well. So, you know, let's say they had inventory on the shelf of $10,000. Well, if the, um, and usually that's not decided until sale day, Mm -hmm. there's a count and, you know, sometimes people don't want it. You know, if I, if I use a certain kind of color, but the buyer is not going to use that line of color, well, right. we don't want it. Um, so there's certainly adjustments to that, but you have the math right. But the adjustments can be significant. Right. And sure. And we've got the gift card liability number as well. Right. So if you're thinking that you want to sell your business for a million dollars, you better have a pretty hefty bottom line to warrant that is what I'm hearing. Yeah. And I'd say the majority of our clients, um, you know, we're our probably our niche, our sweet spot is somewhere between two and three million dollars in sales a year. Mm-hmm. You know, so they're they're netting um, 200, 300,000. So they're getting there. You know, mm-hmm. they're they're close to that million dollar mark, I'd say. Um well, doing two to three million and clearing two hundred thousand, almost a ten percent profit margin, is pretty excellent result. Yeah, it is. It is. That speaks to the beauty of having someone like yourself <laughs> and Copsa Ote um, <laughs> advising you, because yeah. that's a very nice result that not everybody yeah. sees. Yeah, that's the target. Um, you know, the industry average is probably right now somewhere in I would say two to five percent, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. kind of sad. Um, but honestly, there's so much room for um, improvement there. If you think about the opportunities that COVID gave us, um, you know, people love their professionals and they missed their professionals and they're willing to pay for it. Um, you know, there's great tools out there to help salon and spa owners figure out what their professional back bar mm-hmm. products are costing them in order to charge that through to the clients, you know. Um, you know, think about when you go get your oil changed or a filter changed on your car, you got to pay for the filter and you have to pay for the labor, right? And so why, why shouldn't I, when I go get my hair done, have to pay for that? Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of tools out there to increase profitability. 
um, right now. People, clients understand that things are more expensive. Think about what we're paying for a gallon of milk right now, what we're paying for bread, what we're paying for gas. You know, they know things are more expensive. There's an opportunity for additional profitability to recoup some of those costs. And with the um, technology evolution that's also been happening, you can do so much of these things electronically. You don't need to pay somebody else to do it. Right. Is- if you know how to use your software, that is. That's right. I, I'm asked this often about, oh, my software doesn't do this or that. And I say, yes, it does. You know, mm-hmm. it, do- it, it does that. You just maybe don't know how to ask it yeah. or don't know where to look for it. But yeah. You really do need to use the technology tools that you have. Um, yeah, on that that uh, that topic of profitability, one of the biggest mistakes. If I'm asked, you know, what is the big mistake that owners make? It's generally in the compensation of yes. the staff. You know, it's the one. It's the biggest cost that we have, and if you get it wrong, it, it's very impactful and it's very difficult to undo. So. Um, well- I like to go through a really simple, simple example. Think of a hundred dollar ticket. Most of the tickets are average tickets are much higher than that these days, but let's just use a hundred dollar ticket. If I'm paying 50% of that out, I also have 2% for merchant fees. I have payroll taxes with unemployment. I'm at 10%. I have my professional back bar, depending on what you're doing and ranging anywhere from five to 10%. You know, at the end of the day. Oh, and then you want someone to answer the phone, right? We need to pay them too. Yes. I'm lucky if I have 40% gross profit, right? Right. And then I have the advertising. I have that front desk person. I have my rent I had to pay. I have utilities. Oh, and your team wants to have coffee in the back room or wine Mm -hmm. for their clients, you know? And so, you know, these are all things that are important for them to understand. And there's only a few of those things that you can impact. And the wages is so hard because Lisa, you and I both know that if I'm not willing to pay you 50%, somebody down the street will, Mm -hmm. because that person down the street doesn't know, they're not going to know for another six months that they're losing money on that person that they offered 50%. Exactly. So, You know, we have to think about other ways to get people to come into the door as employees, I think. And it's being creative about schedules. It's being creative about, um, you know, benefits and things like that. Freedom. You know, I think that's what most people want right now is the ability to be um, to kind of set their own schedule, which is really hard in this industry. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, we can't offer them the world because we're giving away. We're giving away our our home life, you know, if we do that as owners. So no, we, we come from a history of that sort of 50% expectation, which is 30 or 40 years old. And yeah. it made sense in a salon in 1972. It, it does not make sense now. And yet, you know, we didn't have websites or customer service or robes or lounges or locker rooms or herbal tea or, you know, mm-hmm. it, social media, none of it. And that all has to be afforded with that same formula and it just doesn't work, but we're slowly making headway. We do this really cool thing. We call it dollars per client and we look at ticket numbers and we calculate, you know, what does it actually cost per ticket to run the salon? Mm. And we love to have our owners share that with their management team, at least, um, and, or their top performers and say, I know you think that you're only getting $40 of that hundred dollars, but I want you to know where the other 60 is going. Mm -hmm. And because I think the unfortunate part is typically when a technician leaves to go to, or a professional leaves to go do business somewhere else on their own, it's because they think they can make a ton more money and they Mm -hmm. just don't understand the business side of it. And so as owners, if we can educate our people about what it takes to truly run a business you know, yeah, it could mean that they go somewhere someday, but at least they go and they make it, they make the decision being educated versus leaving and next year wanting to come back because they owe all kinds of taxes because they didn't know what they were doing. 
I, I couldn't agree more, April. I think that we really need to keep the staff educated and not that you need to share your entire income statement with them, but I do think that that exercise of here comes $100, I've, I've done this with staffs and said, where, how much of it do you think went to your labor? And they'll say, oh, $25. And it's like, no, it's more than double that. You know, they, how much went to rent? They don't know until don't we know. teach them. So right. it rests on us in the industry to make sure everybody understands yeah. so we can all be profitable in one way or another and sustain right. and sustain the industry and ourselves. Okay. It's a wonderful industry, Lisa, because there are so many people that want to teach it. And like yourself, you know, it's, um, it, I am so honored to be a part of this industry because there are so many great professionals out there that want and teach our clients such great things. Um, and so I was excited to be on your podcast today. Um, you know, Kofsa Odi is not the be all end all for everybody. And and we know that. And, and certainly when it comes to selling your business, you need those other professionals. You couldn't do it with just us. We are not a licensed valuation firm. We're not attorneys. But um, I think my key point is just you got to surround yourself with people that know those things that you don't know. Um, and, and to be successful, that's what you do in everything, in everything that you do. If it's if you're the top colorist at your salon, you know, how are you doing that? You're doing that because you're learning the trade, you're you're getting the training, you're practicing, you're you're making that commitment to do that and your finances have to be the same way. So, for sure. Well, April, I was so happy to be able to have you as a guest. I think that your advice is really invaluable. I'm going to put a link to Copes OT and April McDaniel in the description. So anybody listening, I'd urge you to reach out and get um, really valuable help as you move through your business life. Thanks again, April, for joining us. Thanks, Lisa.